Hey, everyone. It's Joe Glines here out of Dallas, Texas. Yeah, and Jack is still here from Copenhagen, Denmark. And uh, welcome to our 57th Auto Hockey Webinar um, in March of 2021. I, yeah, it's still every time I see this 57, like that's a lot of webinars. Yeah, uh, sure it is. Let's go ahead and get going. So we have 92 registrants now. Granted, like we said, it's, you know, also Jackie reminded me, like, hey, some people may not, you know, international people may not have realized that the time shifted an hour. So we might get people showing up here in an hour. Um, I honestly thought the webinar was next week. So I, I'm glad I, I figured that out this morning because I was like, w w wait a minute here. Um, yeah, so I might have missed it entirely. But uh, we got 92 people registered. Um, we all start off muted, not because, uh, you know, Jackie and I really care to hear ourselves talk. It's just because you get more than two or three people talking and it's just, it's mayhem. Yes. Tower, Tower of Babylon. <laughs> um, but if you have a question, you know, you can use the chat. Um, and, and Jackie or I are monitoring it and, uh, or it, it, you don't have to necessarily write out the question in the chat. Just, you know, if you want to actually ask the question, just tell us you have a question. And then, cause today we have a guest speaker, Isaiah is, he's going to be talking in a, and we'll find a good spot so we don't interrupt him. So let's go ahead and move forward here. So, Hey, I finally, let me, I'm going to copy all this and paste it into the chat, but um, we got, we got the, uh, the new, uh, subdomain set up for the, the automators podcast. So you can go to pod dot the automators. Oh, that's funny. The automator.com. Um, let me make sure that's correct. There we go. And, uh, and like I said, so here are some of the new ones. These, the last, ever since we've switched over to Jackie, we've been doing bullets. We, and I thought we had some really good points. What, what to do before you write one line of code, how long should your variable names be? Um, when selecting a Windows automation tool, of course, we have a bias to auto hotkey, but um, we do discuss other ones and when you might want to use them and how to hire someone to automate your work. Um, this one, and I was talking to Jackie earlier, this is a, a video I put together from a lot of work I did over the years of like 17 different programmatic ways. Well, not all of them are programmatic, but uh, most of them are. And we're probably going to turn this into a webinar as well to discuss each of those ways and the pros and cons of each one, because it's it's something most people use like one or two and aren't aware of all the ways. Not that, not that I list all the ways, but it's a lot. All right. So yeah, thank that, you. And all right. So our script highlighting say, hey, in another big one, um, we finally got our window snipping tool. Now, a lot of you guys probably use this, this tool that I use. I get, it's by far the thing that, that I use most often and I get, the most questions of like, what was that tool you used? It was really great. Um, yeah, so we have a new version. Um, it, it's cool because now if you click the icon, you can um, customize the hotkeys to what you want. So you can adjust them. Um, so they're all configurable. Uh, you can also update the email signature to be your own instead of having to change it in the code. So email signature, and let me tell you here, uh, this is HTML and you can change it to yours. If you mess this up, simply delete everything. And then when you save it, it'll reload it with the default that's there. And then you can just tweak it, right? Um, and you can choose if you want the attachment to be a BMP or a JPEG. Um, so yeah, so it's a, it's, a, it's a great tool that I use 8 million times a day. I can't tell you how many times I use this tool. It's very helpful. Um, and we're gonna actually feature it here in an example. So we're gonna switch over now with Isaiah's um, leading this thing on VS Code. Now, before we jump into it, Jean Lalonde, who's on here also, what was it, maybe four months ago? He, he led a webinar on using Git, um, and, and it was pretty cool. I learned a lot. Um, and then after it, I was talking to Isaiah some, and, and he's like, hey, in VS Code, some of those things that he was demonstrating are just taken care of, and they're even easier. So um, I said, well, why don't you lead us a, a webinar on VS Code and show us how easy it is? So, hey, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Isaiah, and uh, thank you for being a part of this webinar. Today, I'm just going to do kind of like a very quick demonstration of VS Code. Um, keep in mind that this is going to be like a very quick overview of it. Uh, VS Code is a very uh, uh, amazing tool. There's a lot of things that it does, right? What I'm going to do is do kind of like the starting point. Where would you start? Um, and what is the thing, what are the things that I like the most, what I use the most, right? Um, 
I'm just going to start sharing my screen real quick. Um, let's go ahead and do this. You tell me if you can actually see it. We're seeing it. Okay, very good. So that's... And what we're going to do very quickly, um, I'm going to just present uh, a little bit of the installation that goes into uh, VS Code. Now, I'm not going to do like the whole thing because installing VS Code is really, really uh, very straightforward. Um, but installing Git, on the other hand, is not. Now, those two tools together, they build something that is very, um, uh, you know, like an amazing duo. But what I'm going to do is that I'm going to leave a file for you guys, which is a resource link file that has the links to everything. So how, if you want to, at the end of this, download VS Code and give it a try, Git, you have the links there. And the extensions that I normally use, I'm just telling you they're out there. It is not like you have to install them, but they're good to have. So if I go to their pages and download their files, I'm just going to end up with two installers like this, right? Of course, you can select how you want to install it for each of them, either Windows, Mac OS, Linux. The same happens with VS Code. It is something that you can use either in Mac and Linux, Linux as well. So those are two tools that you can use wherever you are. That's one of the reasons why they are so popular, right? Now, um, let me go ahead and start the installation for the VS Code. That's, again, something pretty straightforward for this one. I do like adding the open with. It allows me to do very cool stuff with that. Um, I'm going to show you what they mean later on. But for Git, this is the one that I actually do want to show. Um, uh, Git has a few little things, a few little details. Uh, beside the Windows Explorer integration, which is when you right click on the desktop or well, in any window, it allows you to have some options there, uh, which is the most common thing that I have right away installed because I really use that a lot. But after that, you are, you're asked for many uh, complicated things. Like for example, what is the default editor? In this case, what you want to do is select the Visual Studio code, which we just installed. I'm going to finish that. Let's go ahead and use the Visual Studio code, not the insiders. The insiders is the one if you have the developer version for it. Um, normally, you just want this one here. Um, it's going to tell me like, hey, it's not installed. Let's, let me restart this because it was not installed when I started it. But um, that's one of the the most important things because if you're going to be using, well, if you're going to use um, Visual Studio, then you want to set it to that, but you can actually set up any other any other editor that you want. In this case, we're going to set up Visual Studio. Um, I recommend you leave that one. It is the name of the main repository. When you start, it will ask you for a name of a repository. Historically, the name of the main repository is master. But due to certain things that are going on right now in the United States, they want to change that to something like main. So in my case, I leave, I let Git decide when they change it, then I change it. That's OK. This one, I really recommend you leave it in, in the second part. If you only use this option on the top, you are not going to be able to use um, VS Code with Git. So it is good to, to have that option selected. Um, the OpenSSL library, the, if you are working with enterprise solutions, I recommend you use the Windows Secure Channel. If you're using on personal projects, then I suggest you just keep the OpenSSL. And for this part, um, the, the best thing you could do is switch to the second option, but this is preferential. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the Windows Enter key that actually gives you this control line feed and stuff, right? Carriage return line feed. In Windows, it's just a line feed. So these kind of things create a whole problem for you. I can tell you that <laughs> in certain situations. If you just switch to the line feed style, 
it will save you a lot of trouble because Windows can read that. But in other situations, the, con the car of return and line feed are going to create a lot of issues for you. Um, this one, I would use Minty and the default on here. This is the other part, um, the credentials manager. I suggest you have one, use the Git credential manager. If you don't know what this is all about, it has to do with GitHub. So keep the default manager there, don't remove it because of size or whatever, you need that for GitHub. And now at, at the end, you just finish with this little thing, hit install, now it goes. So GitHub, if you're gonna install it, I suggest you on each page, take your time and read it because there's a lot of little details that depending on how you configure it, you might have a lot of you know, issues later on when you start working with other people. That's where this, the problem really starts. After that, if you, read, if you read everything and you did it correctly, you're not gonna have any issues because after you install this, you're not gonna change the, 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 the defaults very easily. Now, this is the most difficult part of the whole presentation, I'm, I, I promise. Like after that, everything is very easy. Now, there's um, only one thing that we have to do after we installed GitHub, and it is configure our name and email. If you do not have a name and email, when you try to work in VS Code, it's gonna complain about it. So I'm gonna show you how we can uh, configure that in a second. Let me finish with the installation. We finish this off. Now let's just go ahead and open code. And I'll just Every... remind everyone, you know, this is recorded. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. go back later and watch all that. <laughs> yeah, in any case, all this, don't worry, it, it looks like a lot. It really isn't. After you understand more or less what is going on, it's just two installation files. The only thing is that one of them, you have to be careful on how you install them, which is Git. Um, yeah, I'd say with Git, a lot of it, you can go with the recommended. But as uh, Isaiah said here, there, there are a few of them where you might want to decide. On double check on it, right? So just double check. Most of the time, recommended settings are okay, but sometimes you might want to just double check on it. Now, um, everything that I'm going to do here is going to be directly inside of VS Code. So everything that I'm going to use Git for is going to be directly in uh, uh, Visual Studio. And before I really go into a lot of detail, the first thing that I'm going to do is open the terminal. So if I click in view here, I'm going to select the option to open a terminal, or I could use the hotkey for it. And you will notice that a, a PowerShell terminal is going to be directly inside my VS code. So that means I don't have to be going to different windows to work. I could have this in here. And the one thing that I want to do is git config in the global space user name. That actually is something that tells GitHub what is the name that I'm going to use. I'm going to use Isaias Vice as my name. And the same, I'm going to do exactly the same, but instead of username, I'm going to use email. The reason why you need an email is during your commits, everything gets logged with your name and email. So now my email, graptorx at gmail.com. And that's it. You have configured Git, the basics of it, right? Now, now that I have Git configured and I have VS Code configured, let me go ahead and take a look at what Visual Studio is. Now, um, when you start, it is very easy to, uh, to see that they try to make it as minimal as possible. You do not have a lot of things going on at the same time. Now, you can have a lot of things going on at the same time, but mainly they wanted to do it very easy to interface. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna open the one that I have in my computer that is already set up and everything so that I could actually just go ahead and show you directly here what it looks like. So, here in my, um, this is what it looks like when you start kind of like having a lot of things, but let's go ahead and start with nothing there. On the left side, you're gonna have the main panels of what, where you're gonna spend most of your time. Um, you're gonna have, for example, your file explorer, which is one of the things that 
um, allow you to see which files are in your folder, in the folder that you're working with right now. And one of the things that I do want to mention about this file explorer is that it has a lot of, you can do a lot of things there that you, that you could do directly on, on Windows Explorer. So you could drag and drop files into folders. You can actually press F2 to kind of like change the name of a file or the, uh, the, the extension or something like that. So you can change those. You can delete files by clicking the, the, the delete key. If you didn't want to do that, you can press Control Z and it's going to come back. So basically, you are in a Windows Explorer window right there. You very likely will not need to go out of this to work with files most of the time. You don't have to go out of here. And that's the idea that you don't move that often. Um, the second part that I, um, I do want to show you is the command panel. Um, VS Code, everything that you can do in here, like for example, whenever you select something, whenever you copy a lineup, every single one of those things is thought of as a command. And if I want to do something, for example, let's go ahead and take a look at a very long line. So if I don't have one, let's go ahead and create one. So I have a very long line. As you can see, kind of like it wraps around. I don't want that. Now, I, instead of me having to navigate all the menus to check where that option is, I could just go ahead and press Control Shift P. And that is gonna bring me all the commands that this editor can have. And we just type wrap, and it's gonna show you the commands that have to do with that. And not only that, and this is the part that I use it the most, is if I forgot the hotkey, that's what I use it for. All the commands that I, I know, like I know I could do this, is there a hotkey for it? I just write the name of the command and then I remember what the hotkey is. You can press it and as you can see, the line wrap is toggled on, uh, off in this case and on, back on. So basically that's the, the, the command palette is very useful to know what you could do, especially if you need to search for a command if you forgot the hotkey. Now, beside that, and most of those things are similar as to other um, 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 editors, but then we have the source control file. Now this pane here, so this panel here allows me to take care of all the changes that I'm gonna handle with Git. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about Git in a, in a few minutes before we dive into this panel, but here on the left, you have the Explorer, and down here we have the source control, which is a very, very big part of uh, how I use VS Code. Now, another thing that you might need to get used to, and many people don't uh, very easily, is navigating the code in, um, in uh, uh, VS Code. Now, as you can see on the right side, there's this minimap of the file, which gives me a very high overview of what the file looks like. It is good to kind of like knowing where you are in a document. And it is annoying having to scroll down and up looking for something. Now, here in VS Code, there is something that I use very often. It's down here in the Explorer window. At the bottom, you have the outline section. This outline, what it does is that it creates a list of all the functions and labels that you have in your file and you can easily just jump around. You just click on one of them and it just jumps to wherever that is located at. Now, that is really convenient. And the other part that is very convenient about it is that you could actually filter. If you have something clicked here on the left, and you start typing, like for example, color, um, as you can see, it is gonna start highlighting them, but if you put the mouse on top of it, you can actually filter by it and it will automatically just show you the functions and labels that contain the word color. And 
If you click on it, it actually takes you to that location as well. So basically, this is a very interesting way for me to um, navigate code, especially code that I have never seen before. So if I want to see somebody sends me code and I'm like, okay, what does this do? Uh, do? Then I could just have a high level overview of it um, in a way that I know more or less what it's doing. And if there's a function that I'm kind of interested in, then I just click on it, right? So that online panel is something that I use very often, especially if I'm taking a look at uh, code <laughs> that is not mine, right? Um, on the other hand, um, we do have the debugging functions with uh, VS Code. And that's the other part that is kind of like really huge for me. Um, before we dive into that, I don't know if you guys uh, uh, have any questions regarding this little part here. The only thing I was going to point out, which is obvious, pretty obvious, but uh, your Explorer thing on the left where you were showing the... Um, not the, the I'm sorry, I shouldn't say explore the outline outline. Um, oh, right. So the outline is down here, right here. It's, you know, it's what's cool also is it's alphabetical, right? So if, if, you know, it is true. It's not, um, yeah. Oh, then you can change, you can change it. You by can the, change it either by the position of the function yeah. inside the file by name or by category, which is functions mm -hmm. are going to be closer to functions in mm -hmm. alphabetical order. And, uh, uh, so labels are going to be in labels. So yeah, you can actually switch. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of like how you want it. Cool. Now, the follow cursor here is an amazing feature, but it is not available for Aroha key language in this, at, the, at this point. Um, but in other languages, if you are selecting, uh, so mm -hmm. if you move the cursor to one place, Good here update. on the left is actually going to yeah. go to that location. So it is something that is very cool, but not supported for Aroha key at the moment. <laughs> um, in any case, I did add, I will add a file that has kind we, of like the- We actually got a question in the chat. Okay, so- um, About the outline, outline, where yes. uh, Dimitri, he says, does the outline need to be configured? He has it open, but no functions are visible for him. Um, I don't remember having to configure it. You don't have to configure it. Now, depends on the language that you're using. So. This language here, uh, the language identifier, and that's partly what I was gonna mention. That thing is um, uh, given by this extension. So this extension is able to parse and give syntax highlighting for auto hotkey, but it adds debugging features like this and language features. So the debug files, I'm gonna give you a little overview of that in a second but the language features that it provides is exactly that with the, with the um, they're called, uh, well, the tokens, these uh, symbols, method symbols and um, variable symbols. Those symbols are the ones that are shown in the outline, but those are provided by this particular extension. If you don't have that extension, you will not be able to have them. Yeah. I'd say I just opened VS Code as well, uh, and it opened with the, the welcome tab. Right, uh, yes. Tell me what happened in the newest update. And when, as long as I had that tab focused, of course, my uh, outline was empty as soon as I actually uh, focused uh, code tab. All right, uh, of course, you have, to have, you have to have a, a, a file that contains functions to be outlined, right? So if you are in focus of something that does not contain functions or uh, symbols, as I'm referring to them, um, then the outline function is not gonna work out, right? Now, um, again, another thing like the find reference method, uh, Jackie was telling me like he uses this a lot. Um, like if you are in a, in a file and there is a function that has been used, a custom function that you created um, and it is being used and you want to see the declaration of it, you could just right click on it and there's an option that says find all references and that and, or go to the definition in here, go to the definition or go to references. Those are things that are very useful to jump from one part of your screen to another very quickly, just to whatever you're working with right now at this point. 
Now, um, again, just to come back to what I was saying, the next topic is uh, I wanted to just uh, highlight that you will need some extensions. Uh, for example, I, I say need, this is optional, but this particular one, the bookmarks <laughs> extension, I was surprised that I needed a book, uh, an extension for this. VS Code does not allow you to have bookmarks. Um, it doesn't have it implemented, so you would need um, a, a, an extension for it. This is the one that I use. And all these extensions are going to be linked in a file that I have that have all the resources. Just check it out, what they do. Um, the auto hotkey, the bookmarks. Now I do have Git graph, Git lens. Those two guys are amazing. I have never used Git this way before. Um, and I really love them. Uh, I will not go into details about them, but I really recommend you taking a look at them. Um, if you have already worked with Git, I recommend you taking a look at that. And Git Lens is kind of like just telling you who made some changes on which line. You probably uh, couldn't see it very uh, well, but right next to the script here, there's a little text that is kind of like, um, I don't know if you can see it very well. It tells you like who changed that line, when and in which comment. And that my friend, it, it is, if you're looking for a specific bug and you know that it was in this line, it tells you more or less where that bug started because I know when the last change was. That is something that, um, of course, it can give you more information, but that's the main use that I have for it. And I would seriously recommend you taking a look at that. Now, talking about debugging, um, the AutoHotKey uh, Plus extension gives you the uh, possibility of debugging, okay? It's basic debugging, but it's still debugging. <laughs> and you're gonna be doing a lot of that when you're coding. So <laughs> um, here at the top of the, of the screen, you will have this button to run and debug your script. If you press on it, the script is simply going to be run and is, a, a debug console is gonna be presented down here. If your script has the output debug command with anything that you have there, when you run your script, um, that is going to be output. Uh, it's going to be output to the debug console that is already integrated into your VS Code, which is good. This is amazing. So I don't have to do message boxes any longer. I just do the output debugs, right? The the thing I'd add to that though, Isaiah, is is even if you leave it there. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't stop the script. So if you ship it out, you know, and give it to someone else, they, they will not notice. <laughs> interfere it. Yeah. And that to me right. was like, wow, that's awesome. Right. That that uh is mainly the point of using the output debug command so that in any case, those messages are not reaching the end user, right? But now um one of the most powerful things that you could do is that even though my script is running. I could set breaks on my script. And that allows me to go line by line. So I run my script and I just set a break by putting, clicking uh, on the outside of the number line here. So you have these numbers here. And if you click on the left, you just set a break. And that break, whenever your script reaches that line, now your script is in debug mode. And that allows you to go line by line. And that allows you to verify how the script is actually running. So in here, in this case, so I just want to check what happens with this particular um, if statement. So let me go ahead and go there. So I'm in the if statement, and now I could verify whether the, that particular variable, what it contains. So it is telling me that if I place the mouse on top of it, you can see what that variable has. And this if statement says, if that file exists, well, if that file doesn't exist, it will do something. As you will see, the line gets jumped. So that means that the file exists. So I could check the logic of my program line by line while it is running and this is something amazingly powerful, especially 
when you go to the debug panel here on the left, and you can actually access all the variables that your script has at that particular moment. And you can even change them. Like you see the clipboard, it has whatever I copied a few seconds ago, I change it to test. And well, this variable cannot, I cannot modify the clipboard by the way, <laughs> like that. <laughs> but basically I could grab a, um, a normal variable um, like icon file, for example, which is part of an object. I could actually change that variable to whatever I want before running that line. And that is completely powerful. Um, this configuration file here, I could change it before running the line. And now I would test, okay, what happens if, if, if the, um, how could I, uh, what happens if the user input this? What would happen to my program if somebody actually typed this? And you would see the effects of it right there when you click on the next line, then everything changes and you could see the effects right there. So debugging like this is extremely powerful, is extremely useful. And um, it is one of the main reasons why I switched to um, VS Code, not only because I have a debugger like this, but it, I also have the debug console and the terminal right there in my editor. So I don't have to be switching back and forth between different things, okay? So this is kind of like the main purpose of all those things. Right. So um, before I jump into the next topic, um, this is kind of like the main overview of what VS Code is all about, how you can use the main features of it. And now I want to dive into um, Git. So why are people actually jumping into VS Code? Well, because it has a lot of very good features for Git. Now, I am not gonna see all the features. I'm just gonna go ahead and show you kind of like the basics of them. Now for that, let me just start with a blank project like this. So this particular uh, window right now is a completely blank um, uh, window that I just created by creating a new window here. Um, whenever you start, you have the option of opening a folder where you want to start working, opening a specific file if you want, or you can clone a repository from either GitHub and so on. So I'm gonna show those two things. Let's go ahead and open a folder. Let's go ahead and open, I don't know, something. We're gonna start here. We have a folder, a blank folder here. And I want this to be my Git repository. How do I start? Now, um, first of all, let's create an, a file. I could just click here to create a file. My file is gonna be test.hk, for example. That's gonna start my file. Um, and let's type something. This is my file. That's it. So I'm just saving that file. It is there. Now, I want to keep track of every single change. I due to this uh, particular file, that's where Git comes into place. So Git will keep track of changes. And the way how I start a repository is that I go to my left panel here, to the source control and initialize the repository. That's it. When you're working with source control, there's three stages that you are going to be working with new changes, stage changes, and committed changes. Sometimes you don't want to commit your work, like you want to do some changes and you are probably gonna continue working on that later. So you don't want to save that snapshot yet. That's where you have like this intermediate place with stage changes. Let me show you what I mean. My file is on track. And when I click on it here in the source control, I could see that it was empty. And on the right side, what is new? Well, it has a new line. Now, I want to commit that. I want to save that into kind of like an archive that I could refer to it later on, even if my computer dies, <laughs> kind of. Um, what I would do is just 
add the changes here, hitting the plus sign to what is gonna be committed. This is not committed yet. The reason why this is very useful is that I have my changes already staged for commit, but I could keep working. I could actually, oh, hold on. I forgot to add something and I save that. Now my file has new changes and you will see that now you have things divided here. You have your current changes, which is the new part that you just added, added and the staged changes, which is the one that you said that you were gonna commit. Hey, and you, yeah. I interrupt you just for a minute, because as I said earlier, when I was first learning this, the one thing that really confused me was to me, everything you're describing right here was stuff syncing to GitHub. No. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I get it. Right. <laughs> In this case, none of this has anything to do with GitHub. This is with your files. And right now, what I'm going to show you when I commit the changes are local changes. So all of this is in your computer right now, right? right. That's all I want to clarify was, right, yeah. me, I'm like, oh, it's all syncing. No, it's not. It's, it's no, it's local. not syncing. This is local. Commit um, is it's something that has to do with your computer, right? <laughs> now, in this case, those things, now I have different changes. I have stage changes. And if I hit now here, I set a message. Yes, you have local changes, but in Git in the Git repository. Now think of it, think of Git as a storage room. You have your file. Whenever your file is in a specific state that you like, you're gonna save a snapshot of it on that storage room. And then you keep working. And when it is in a different state that you actually like, you save a snapshot of it on that repository. And later, you can actually refer to any stage of your program and you can see how it evolves. And the cool thing about that is that if you're trying to find a bug, it will be good to see how you came about that bug. It's kind of like one of the biggest points of it. In any case, just to commit a change, you just have to go here in the source control, add a message to that change. Like for example, it is a feature, added a new line and you, hit the check mark here or hit control M and that is gonna be saved into a commit. But notice that my file only has one line. Whatever snapshot I saved only has one line, but my real file has two lines. That's the beauty of it. You have two different files. One is a snapshot, one is your real file. Now I can just go ahead and add my changes. Oh, feature add line that I forgot. Save that into a different commit. Now my file has been divided into two commits. Think of, think of them as snapshots. There's a snapshot where I only have one file and there's another snapshot where I have two files. That's what Git is all about on a local repository, right? So. I just showed you how to commit changes. And basically, um, right now, if I see that that's where Git graph comes into place, I want to see the evolution of my file. Down here at the bottom, you can see that um, there's a button that says Git graph. If I click on that, you will see the, the, uh, the changes made one by one. My first change is added a new line, my second change, added a line I, that I forgot. And like this, I will be adding more and more changes. And those changes can get complicated at times, but those snapshots are very good if I am looking for some specific things later on, because I want to go back to a specific version. That's what Git does. It allows you to roll back to a different version. I will show you later on a, a, a graph of a real project and you will see how it might look like. But right now it's just two simple uh, things. But what happens? That commit, I did it wrong. I didn't want to commit that what I committed. Let me change that. How do I do that? How do I revert that? How do I go back? Well, here in VS Code, in the source control panel on the left, you click on the three dots 
um, sorry for the for the source control thing. And you have this menu, menu here. And for the commit, you can actually undo the last commit. And that actually will bring back the commit. And as you can see, now my graph changed to one commit and some uncommitted changes. Now, in this case, as I reverted my commit, I could actually now add more changes to it. I forgot to add something and I amended the amend now, whatever. Now I go back to my source code, add the new changes, and I say, well, my commit was not just of one line. I wanted to commit two lines right now. And now I make my commit and my Git graph is gonna come back to two commits again. Now, those are the, the strictly basic stuff that you could do with Git. And the good thing about having it directly into your editor is that all those things don't have to be done in a different window, which is kind of like, if you have, if you have worked with Git before and you had an editor, you know that the, 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 the pain of saving a lot of files and I forgot to commit, like it is very annoying. But as I'm here, I can even set up VS Code to auto commit for me at certain intervals or auto push the changes to a, an online repository. So it facilitates what you're doing. And that's great. I don't need more work. I need less work. <laughs> uh, so in this case, I'm good with the commits. Let's go ahead and create a branch. <clears throat> you might notice right here that you have something that, is, uh, that says master, right? And here on the left, you can see that as well. It says master. That is the current branch where you are. Think about it as a different world. It's a different world. And if you have code that is working perfectly fine, the least thing you want to do, the last thing you want to do is test stuff on that code. Because if it doesn't work and it breaks, then your code, your code that is working fine, is going to break. What you want to do is create a different branch that does not affect your main code. And now in the new branch, you can test new ideas. You can break the code. You can do whatever you want. And you know that later on, you can come back to your main code. That's the idea of branches. You just go out of them uh, in a different branch, test whatever you want, do whatever you want, and then you can come back to your code that you know is working. So to do that on the left side, you just click on the name of the, uh, of the branch where you're in and you can create a new branch. So we are going to create a new branch. The name of that branch would be development, for example. And now you have two branches. And here on the, on the Git graph, you can see one that says development and the other one says master, right? So those are my two branches. If I save code in one of them, that code is not gonna be saved on the other one automatically. So I here on the left, it tells me in which branch I'm in. I'm gonna stay in development and I'm gonna add new thing. This is in the development um, branch. I save that, let's commit it. Let's go ahead and commit that change. I add my changes, say, you will see that in my graph, now my development branch is ahead of my master branch. The development has new information that master does not have. So now I could keep adding stuff like new line in development, development. I'm, I have been actually misspelling that. <laughs> like several times, right? <laughs> and, and yeah, it's okay. Now I add my new line, committed, new line again. And you can see that my development branch is going forward and master branch is staying behind. Here's the funny thing. 
This is my file in development. Now, if I switch to my master branch, I just click down here, right? I click on development and I click on master. You will see that my file gets updated automatically. That's the main idea. You can have different versions of the same file in different branches and they don't collide with each other. Like they're totally different worlds. And that allows you for, for example, in development to test new things without breaking the code that you already know that is working. So that's what Git is all about. And now you know how to create different branches. You just click here and create a new branch. And you can have as many branches as you want. And later on, what you do is that you merge them. And that's the next concept that I'm gonna uh, show you. But basically notice that if I switch to development, my lines of code get added. If I switch to master, the lines are deleted. And if there are more changes in between, the changes get, you know, whatever the changes between two files are, Git is gonna recreate the file for you, which is the most important thing about Git. Now, yeah, I developed, I tried a lot of things in development. I like them. I think that they are working good for my taste. Um, my master branch, I know that is working. My development branch, I tested code, it is working. I am happy with it. Now I want to share it with the world. I could right click on it and I just merge it into the current branch. And when I do that, it tells me, um, how, do you want to, how do you want to merge it? Leave it like that. You don't, you don't want to change many of, of those things unless you know what you're doing, but you just, yes, merge. And it tells me now in the graph, I can see exactly what happened. Here at this point, I decided to test something in my development branch. I went out to my development branch. I tested stuff and I'm happy with them. Now I merge them back to my master branch. Now, if I switch between my development branch and my, ma and my, and my uh, master branch, they're gonna look the same because now my changes are merged. Basically, what I just showed you is what you're gonna be doing 90% of the time if you're doing Git. You're gonna jump to a different branch, do some testing, test something out, until it works. When it works, you're gonna merge it to your main branch, which is the one that only contains work. Uh, uh, it only contains working code. You never, you never push something to master that is not working. Like, no, I'm gonna test it later. No, no, no. That should be in your development branch. <laughs> That's what it is. Um, so basically, um, the, the development branch is usually kind of like hidden. You, only the developers see that branch. The master branch is what the users see. And that's where it comes like, if you're using Chrome, you download Chrome, what you just downloaded is your user code. But there is like a developer ver version. The developer version is the branch that is for developers, kind of. It's not exactly that, but it is kind of like the idea of what is going on. Um, now that you know all those things, the one thing that uh, I would like to show you is um, working with an online repository. So all the things that we are doing is local. This is just in my computer. You don't have access to it. But what if I'm working with something that is completely like uh, from code from another person? So here I opened a new window and what I'm gonna do is yet, yeah, I'm gonna clone a repository. So here uh, you will put the URL of the repository that you want to clone. So say for example, you want to go to GitHub as an example, it could be anything else. Um, and I want to clone Lexicos repository. He has Arohat Kiel. Um, but what I would do is just grab this link that is here, you see it, just copy it and go back to Visual Studio and paste that link there. You hit enter and it's gonna ask you, okay, 
Where do you want to put that? Let's save it in downloads here. It's going to do its thing. And after it's cloned, now you have his files and his history. You can see the whole history of what has he been doing. And as you can see, <laughs> it can get quite complex, right? Now, um, I'm not gonna go over all that, don't worry. But the main interesting thing here is that now, again, you see that I'm here on the left, I'm in the master branch. Well, I want to make some changes to his code. Don't do it in the master branch. That's the first thing. You're gonna create a new branch. You're gonna say testing or whatever name you want, can be whatever you want. Now you grab one of the files and let's make changes to it. Oh, let me just remove this because I don't like his license. Let me change the parts that I don't like. Save my file. And now I could commit my changes. Ah, removed license. Usually that should be a short description of, of what we did. That is in my branch. He hasn't seen that. But I am working in my code. And later on, I could just push my changes to his repository by pushing my code. Now, that's what um, Joe was actually kind of talking about. Like, hold on. Um, I was confused about local and pushing. Well, here's where it goes. I just used the code from somebody else. I made changes to it. Now I want him to have my changes. There, that's when you start with pushing the code to an online repository. The terms pull and push refer to online things, pull things from an online repository and push changes to an online repository. And in this case, both of those things, you can do them um, here in Git by selecting either pull or push. And that's it. You just go ahead and push your changes. Of course, in this case, um, this is not my repository. So what is gonna happen is that he's gonna get what is called a pull request. It is gonna tell them like, hey, there are some changes that I want you to add to your repository. And the developer is gonna say like, nah, I don't like those changes. I'm not gonna push them and that's it. Or, oh, wow, that was very good. Let me pull them in the developer has the last word, whether he's gonna accept your, chain, your changes or not. And again, now you saw how it looks and that doesn't mean that you have to work this way. That doesn't mean that everybody's gonna be like happy that you're gonna send them code, sending them code. But if you need to work with several people at the same time in one project, this is the way to go. And that's the reason why I came back to VS Code because I have everything integrated in one place. I don't have to have different tools doing different stuff. I could have my Explorer, my terminal, my Git, and my debugging tools, tools all in one place. So here's where my presentation ends. I hope that you liked more or less what I showed and you learned a little bit more. If you have questions, well, then this is the time to do them. Well, I had one question just in that last, but you did, which I, I, I know the, I think I know the answer to it, but in that example, you pulled from Lexicos's uh, Git repository right. um, and you're doing some work. If he was to up and remove his repository entirely, you still have all your stuff locally, right? There's, there's no yes. risk of, yeah. Okay. No. So basically here I have a folder that contains a Git folder. This Git folder is the one that has all the changes and everything, right? So even if he removes his online repository like uh, from uh, GitHub, I cannot access it any longer. Well, I still have the whole information here, which is amazing because there's a lot of times when big companies have found themselves that they've lost 
uh, one of their branches or something. Mm -hmm. And they could, out of, somebody can just simply send this folder and they have all his, their history back. So you, you do not um, lose everything at once. I jump in just for a comment. Yes, go ahead. It was a very great presentation. It's, it's really the merging of the two tools I use every day, which is site for AutoAd key. And it is, uh, I have a repository on GitHub. And what I've shown a few weeks ago, a few months ago, you mentioned uh, Joe, was source tree, which is a kind of visual front end to, um, to GitHub or to Git repository. And it has all the same lines where you see the, 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 the progress of your different branches. But having all this integrated in one tool is very, very uh, interesting. Saves so, time, right. Yeah, I knew I would have to take a look at that. But now I have no choice to uh, <laughs> dive in. Uh, yeah, you, you haven't used it yet. But basically, I think uh, the main uh, uh, pool that VS Code have over people because everybody's jumping to it for a while now. So uh, Adam was the first um, editor that had all these features. And then Microsoft jumped into it and modified it to make it better. And that's where VSCOM came into uh, to life. And everybody's jumping to VS Code. The reason is they merged just the right tools. An output debug window a terminal, a Git integration, and Windows Explorer all in one yeah. place. It, you don't have to be jumping around. Everything is there. Joe mentioned that uh, you can work live with someone else. You can collaborate with someone else. Is it live or is it by committing and seeing the changes that has been committed that when you work with someone else at the same time on the same file? Right. Um, it is not live in the sense as real time. Okay, not the same um, thing as in Word in Office, for example. No, right? no, 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 no. Okay. It's not the same. And, and thank God it's not like that. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank God it's not like that because two people modifying the same line over and over again might be a problem. Yeah. But um, uh, what he meant is that in any changes that I have, um, I could push them to a centralized place that we both can draw from and we are always synchronized. Um, why don't you go back to, to Lexicosis? Because there we, we could see the there were different people working on stuff. Yes, actually. Now, now here is one of the things that I really liked. When, during the installation of VS Code and Git, I selected some checkboxes. Uh, in VS Code, they're not selected by default, so you have to be pay attention to them. Um, and it is like, if I right-click here, it gives me the option to open with code. It saves a lot of time. Um, I just right click here, I open the whole thing. And this is one of the things that I really love. And right clicking Git bash here, I usually use Git mainly from the command line and it has its advantages. Some things you cannot do in GUIs. Um, but uh, opening a terminal and going was a pain. So I just right click Git bash here. And I already have my Git here, so that's what I that's what I use it for. Now, going back to what uh, Joe was saying, um, we could go ahead and uh, open here at the bottom Git graph. Now I have my graph. Now on the left, you could see that here the author of this commit is <laughs> Isaiah. That's me. Um, Lexicos is the one that works the most on this, but you have Hegel Fegel. I don't know how his name, what his name is, but <laughs> he is the guy that um, uh, did some changes and you will notice that whenever he makes commits, so take a look at this commit is Hegel Fegel, right? Now that line is on a green line. It's on a green line. That means what he did is from here, he created his own branch, right? Now in his branch, while he was in his branch, Lexicos committed a lot of changes. So Lexicos was actually making a lot of changes and then he saved his work and Lexicos continued working on his thing. At some point, 
Hegel Fegel submitted that and said, Lexicos, I finished with whatever I was doing. Do you want to pull it? Do you want to merge it? And Lexicos merged it here into his branch. You see? So now Lexicos work and Hegel's Fegel's work were joined into this line. After that was tested, and they tested it for a long time, you can see they have been testing that for a long time. And still up to, up to this point, those changes that they made haven't been merged back to the master branch, which is that you and I could actually kind of like um, access, like a, in the download folder or whatever, they haven't merged it to the official build. So if you want to access the changes that they made, you would have to access the development branch. And in this case, um, if you go to autohotkey.com, what you would see is that they have the, the current version, which is the master branch, and the alpha version, which is kind of like the development branch. You see this alpha download here is actually pointing directly, as you can see here, um, to origin alpha line here. It says origin alpha. This alpha thing here that you're seeing here is what you can access when you click this download button. That's what is going on. So if you click the current version, it's going to be downloading the master, which is the master branch. If you download the alpha version, you're actually downloading a different branch in their code. That's what is going on. So we, we do have a question. Um, someone was asking if they could uh, you know, multi-monitor stuff. Can you open separate code windows? Uh, I'm not sure if he means. Um, yeah, so basically, no, yeah, well, so uh, what he means is probably getting this into its own window maybe. And I think you can. So each, each of the things, I, I have never done that myself, but of course you can have like, um, uh, how do I say this? Let me, let me go ahead and verify this. I don't, I have never done that, but yes, you can have like different, you just take that out of in its own window and you can put your window in another, okay. You can have multiple windows. That's what I'm saying. But I haven't done that very often. You can split your windows and stuff and do other things. But mainly the only thing that you want to do is open it in a different window. That's it. I noticed that they do have some live, you know, collaboration extensions. At the top of my list was one from Microsoft. Oh, right. Yeah, they should have something live here, like collab, live share. And this is real time, real time uh, share. Um, when I was talking about uh, sharing, I was not talking about this, but yes, that's one of the interesting thing about this thing is that you could pull up so many extensions for a lot of interesting things. There was something uh, that allowed us to see the tabs. Uh, so the indentation, you could see indentation in a file um, with colors. So whenever you're working with a file, uh, whenever you have different indentation for different things, if you get really confused by those things, they change the indentation to different colors. So if it is two tabs, it's one color. If it is one tab, it's another color. So you can get an extension for almost anything, even for coloring indentation and stuff like that. So um, it, it is really helpful for some people. I just happen to not, not use it. But if you go to the extension thing, uh, you can find a lot of interesting stuff right down here. Which actually, um, you know what? We were going to mention configuring that auto hotkey one to at least say what what uh what version you're using you know the the auto hotkey version which right um so if you click here on the extensions you can go ahead and configure each of them uh, each extension has different settings right and the auto hotkey plus thing here has uh the extensions for it allow you to set what executable you want to use. By default, it's going to be using the one that you have set up, the, the installation uh, for our hockey. But you can change that to Unicode or 64-bit, for example, if you have a 64-bit uh, uh, 
version that you want to try on. Or you can also just simply go to the auto hot key folder and modify the auto hot key file. If you don't want to do that, then you just change it here. So I'm going to use the U64 bit executable file here, the ANSI 32 bit. You could do that. This, let me actually kind of like join it with something that actually affects when you click here, the run button, when you click run, that's the executable that is going to be used. So if you want to change which executable is used whenever you click in here, um, then that's the way to go. One quick thing, this button here or the F9 uh, hotkey for it opens whatever you have selected at the moment. So if you are in this file, which is basically a library file, which only contains a class and you hit run, you're gonna see that nothing happens and you're gonna be like, what? what is going on? Well, what is going on is that you just run a library file. So what you want to do is kind of like run the script that you want to run. And um, that could also be configured as well so that whenever you press the run key, it doesn't run the current file, but opens a specific file. That um, here on the left, when you go to the uh, debug uh, pack pane, the panel, you can create a launch JSON file. And that file, and it asks you for which language, oh, well, for our hockey. And that file, you see here, it actually tells you to open the current file. That's what it's doing. You can actually change that to the copy path here, change it to my current, uh, um, my current location. Now, keep in mind, and this is very good that I did this. Um, as this is JSON, in JSON, the backslash is actually um, an escape character. So you might want to escape those. So you just want to change those to double and just change those to those in this file. And now, it doesn't matter how many times I press the button or where am I located, it is actually going to run the correct file, which is the, the, the script that I want to run, not the, not the one that is selected at the moment. And that's something that you, you might want to do. And just to clarify, so if you had five other scripts associated with that one, you just have to do that once. You don't have to do that for each one, right? Exactly, it just once. Applies across right. them, okay. Right. That's the idea behind that. Did anybody else have any questions on VS Code? I, I've watched Isaiah. We've spent hours, you know, online. We work together and watching him mo mainly debug, right? Um, and the other day we had we had something come up where we we identified a bug and we had to go back and you know refer to some code that we used earlier and to be able to easily revert and look at what was there before and to go forward. It was it's really cool. I, I must say I use the, the history view, the, the split view, where you can actually see what you did since your last um, change. Um, um, that's that's one of the things that I use like quite a lot. It's I, I think it's is this the button right next to the play button there or the run button? Right. So this this is the the source control where you actually make your commits and stuff, and you can see different commits in there. Um, one of the things that happens is that um, if I have a commit, so this is my commit history, and it's the same that you would see here in Git graph, okay? So in Git graph, you have a commit history of everything that has happened. Now in Git graph, to see that commit is kind of like a little bit more complicated, um, but if we do what Jackie's saying, you just go here to your uh, source control panel, panel um, you go to the commits and you will see um, all the commits for the development branch in this case. And if I click on a particular commit, like fix this thing, and I click on that file, it's gonna show me what the commit was. And this is, ex this is extremely useful because it tells you like, for example, on the left, that's how the file was before. 
on the right what it is. Green lines means that you added lines. Red lines mean that you removed lines. That's what they mean. So basically, in on my um, on my previous file, I was just writing something into an ini file, right? But here, before writing to the file, I added some logic to it. I added if something is being shown, then go ahead and show that. Go to that subroutine, right? that logic was not there. So I could really easily see what the changes were. And if I'm looking for a bug, I might want to do that. I want to know what did I change? What was the change, right? So this is part of uh, why this is so useful um, in a lot of situations. Yes. Is it possible to show, instead of showing it side by side to have it only in one, one pane, if you wish, but with the lines that were removed to be stri strike or stroke, that's a different way that sometimes yes, uh, these things will think, show the changes. I think you can configure that. Um, I have never done that, but it is possible okay. because um, the way how you, and, and by the way, this thing here, uh, let me make a little um, uh, parenthesis there before I go into that. Uh, if you have, if you just install uh, VS Code, the only two things that you will see in this pane is source control, uh, repositories, and source control. Sometimes that is not even shown. It, it just shows, shows source control. Nothing else is going to be shown. That is added by one of my uh, um, extensions, uh, which, if I remember correctly, is Git Lens. Now, Git Lens um, has the option of adding all of those controls that we're seeing, like for, for uh, the commits, the file history, the stashes, and many others, because you can see the, the line history, branches, remotes, all of those little things that I don't have, I don't have them being shown right now. All of them are added by Git Lens. And when you install Git Lens the first time, um, you have this uh, setup. It tells you where do you want to have those, whether you have any special pane or panel, or if you want to put them in source control. And I have it set up that way, that it is in my controls. If you don't see them, it is because you don't have that extension or it is not configured to be shown in this, in this panel. Now, to go to your point, yes, diff, uh, uh, diff tools like this one usually can be configured uh, into showing everything in one line, uh, in one pane, instead of um, doing two panes like this. Uh, you can see that they are prepended with plus signs and minus signs. Minus would be removed, plus would be added. And uh, I'm not really sure what that option is, which I would assume that is inline view or something. Yeah, there it is. So the inline view would show you only one panel. And now the red line would uh, signify that it is removed. The green line would be added. Those two things are on the same line, 1523. Okay, so that's, we're referring to the same line there. Okay, and line 1525, was removed and a few lines were added. So yes, you can have this, this uh, view, uh, which is called the inline view. Yeah. If you prefer that, that's, that's the okay. way I'm used to work, but uh, it's a matter of preference, but that's good. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. You can actually see that. In my case, I really got used to this thing. <laughs> um, but in the end, you're getting the same answer of what happened with the file. You just have to know how to read it. Um, someone also asked about the access to the help commands. You just hit F1 and if you're on a command, what does it, how do you get to the auto hotkey help? I mean, oh, for the auto hotkey help. No, I haven't. I think you would be able to configure it some way, but I don't have that. Um, mainly what we do so the AutoHotKey language uh, highlighter, what it does is that if you're going to type a, a command, 
and you press tab, it actually fills it out with the options. So usually you don't have to go to the help file um, because I already know what I'm looking for. Um, but you can have more information. I think, um, let me just one second. Uh, by clicking there, but again, this is just the basic description of it. And this has to do with the Auto Hotkey Plus extension. It is a basic extension. It doesn't give you way too much details. Some other languages give you more detail than that. But for Auto Hotkey Plus, that's as much as you can get, actually. And I'm sorry, you have to go to the, to the documentation still. I, I, I usually do that. But most of the times I don't. I remember what it is just because I see the options in one line. So as soon as I see the, yeah, the, the you parameters. Don't have, you don't have right. to go there to get the order anymore. Kind no, of. I, I, my main use for the documentation yeah, was what's the order of the parameters? That's my main use. Should I put the variable first and then yeah. the location or the location and then the variable? Uh, but as soon as I have this, like, I, I don't need to do that any longer. <laughs> and if I don't you think are... it was ever pointed out, but yeah, my visiting of the documentation probably cut in half or more. All right. Yeah, it's true. I, I, I could attest to it. Um, those, those file append, uh, is, is it the text and then the file name or the file name and then the text? Because my way of thinking is like, I'm going to append to a file in my mind would be like, give me the file first and what you're gonna append next. But the, the thing is the other way around. I always forget, but as soon as I type file append and hit tab, then it just goes ahead and adds that. And I don't, I don't mind any longer. So let's, let's uh, give me a second here. Let me stop. So we stop the recording and start it up again.